Are you having sleepless nights worrying about how you're going to afford the All Things Must Pass Uber edition? Or are you having sleepless nights worrying about how you're going to tell your partner that you've already spent $999.98 on it? Or do you feel guilty about contributing to the wealth of corporate greed? If you answered yes to any of these questions, we have the answer for you. Parlygram Auctions are proud to announce the George Harrison All Things Must Pass Trash Can Edition. This ultra limited environmentally friendly set contains exclusive All Things Must Pass relics, which we have rescued and curated for you to enjoy and treasure forever. Like the official Uber set, this edition is full of things that would be cool to own, but you don't really need. Here's what the set includes. Instead of the Uber's elaborate 96 page scrapbook with unseen imagery and memorabilia, we're including this vintage pre-loved Beatles scrapbook featuring a few badly cut out pictures of George, which comes free with that impossible to replicate vintage smell. We haven't felled any trees to make a bookmark you'll never use. We have something much more useful. This original Boots Record Department carrier bag. Perfect for taking along to your next flea market. And it's made with bioplastic. There's no replica gnomes in our set. We give you the real thing. There's one each to represent the other three members of the Beatles. There's John, Paul, and of course, the lovable Ringo. Whilst Uberset owners will be enjoying Paramahansa Yogananda's Light from the Great Ones book, you'll be able to kick back with the Ladybird Book of Mindfulness. A book of wisdom and fun, it will really get you in the right frame of mind to listen to this album. Although our set doesn't have the 70 tracks including 47 demo recordings, unreleased session outtakes and studio jams, we have included not one, but two rare copies of the original album. First, the UK 8-track cartridge, still housed in its original box, and also the original UK 1st cassette edition, both in fabulous zero Dolby stereo sound with the dynamic range of this trash can. The Rudrachka beads in the Uber set are designed to have a calming effect on your heart and senses, but we think these inexpensive, highly coloured wooden beads will do the job just as well. All of this track, I mean treasure, is housed in a handcrafted all metal container, specially designed so when you've done with it, can actually be used as a trash can. This special limited edition collection is yours now for only. Unfortunately, the trash can edition is not for sale, but in this video, I'm going to be looking at George Harrison's incredible first solo album. And before you ask, no, I did not order the Uber set. I ordered the five vinyl set. However, in this video, I'm gonna concentrate on the original UK issue and look at its variations and find out how it sounds. We've not spent much time covering solo Beatles releases on this channel. In fact, this is the first. So before I get started, I'd like to show you a book which has been a great source of information for me and one which I highly recommend. It's called Vinylology. The Beatles Solo, The Ultimate Guide to UK LP Pressings Variations, 1968 to 2000. If, like me, you're a fan of detail, this book will be right up your alley. It goes through everything from covers, labels, inner sleeves of every UK pressing of their solo albums until the year 2000. It really is a goldmine of information and is essential if you want to find out which pressing you have. It's written by a very knowledgeable author named Dennis Shabes, and it's published by the Dutch publishing company Apcor Books. And I've put a link in the description below if you want to find out more. All Things Must Pass was released in 1970, first in the US on November the 27th, and then three days later on November the 30th in the UK, and became the first triple vinyl set of original music by a single artist. 
Triple album box sets at that time were unheard of in pop music and had strictly been the preserve of opera or classical music. A fact which presented many issues to retailers at the time, most notably being the storage and display. It was also one of the most expensive. And like now, Beatles fans back then were used to forking out big sums on their records and were still smarting from the Let It Be box set earlier that year. If you've watched our past videos on Beatles cassettes, you might be familiar with this. It's an EMI cassette and 8-track cartridge catalogue from summer 1971, which lists on its dedicated Beatles page the album's cassette and 8-track formats, priced at £5.50, and pence, which back then was about $13. Back in 1971, a pound really meant something, and the equivalent inflation-adjusted price of this set today works out about 80 or £90 pounds or dollars which will easily buy you the new set and give you change for the bus home. So what did you get for your money back then? If you were into cassettes, you got two yellow label tapes, which were initially available with this full bleed front cover design, which changed in mid-1974 into this more familiar gold top format. The 8-track was just hitting its stride at this point and initially appeared sporting this tombstone label design which was quickly replaced by this toned-down black-and-white affair. The cassette and 8-track cleverly kept the first two albums on one tape and put the Apple Jam record on the other. Both tape formats were housed in a specially designed cardboard box. This is the one from the 8-track. It's extremely hard to find today as most quickly fell apart and were quickly trashed. The sound quality of these tapes, like most from this era, is nothing to write home about. Being pre-Dolby, they're pretty muddy sounding, but they're nice artifacts to own. Of course, the real star of the show was the triple vinyl set, which stayed in print in the UK with its initial first pressing matrices well into the early 1980s. Most copies were manufactured in late 1970, early 1971, but true early copies are not easy to find, as due to all its different components, transitional and hybrid copies are common. As far as labels are concerned, the earliest UK pressings look like this. Firstly, one of the earliest labels carried the recorded in England text, which was definitely copied, maybe in error, from the US set but this was quickly deleted, leaving just the an EMI recording text. Secondly, early pressings omitted the Micolico publishing credit from the labels. Labels which include that credit are the most common, which is not surprising because they remained unchanged until the late 1980s, when the album briefly appeared on the Green Apple label. It was only at that point which the album was recut. Discs 1 and 3 were recut as Dash 3-2, Dash and Dash 2, Dash 2 respectively, while Disc 2 was left unchanged. As far as the box is concerned, there has over the years been a lot of confusion about which version came out first. In all, there were six variations of the UK box. There's no doubt that all of the earliest boxes were made in the US. The first ones had a small circular printed in USA symbol inside the lid without Apple's US address printed at the bottom of the credits. The next variation is the same as the first, except that the small printed in USA symbol was missing. The third type saw its reintroduction, along with the addition of Apple's New York address below the production credits. The fourth type retained Type 3's details, but probably due to contractual issues, omitted Eric Clapton's name from the credits. It wasn't until the fifth type that the made and printed in Great Britain box appeared. The British box had a much more quality feel to it and was 5mm deeper than the US boxes. Again, Eric Clapton was omitted from the credits, but the country of manufacture is more than clear. The increased depth of the UK box was probably an error, as was the blank appearance of the right-hand side of the box, where the lower tray was either uncovered or lined with white paper. As a result of the box being deeper, the contents didn't fit snugly inside enough. This had to be fixed by adding a piece of corrugated card, which was either coloured white or orange. The final box type from the 1980s was white on both sides and was the correct width. The first US box is exactly the same as the UK one, 
And this album is unique as far as Beatles related product goes in that both share the same catalogue number, STCH 639. As you know, the albums inside were housed in three different coloured inner sleeves, all of which were printed in the USA. There were no UK printed coloured inner sleeves. Most are the textured type, although there were some smooth ones with white paper lining from the mid-1970s, which are harder to find. Tom Wilkes, the designer of the box, had originally come up with a different design for the poster to the one which was eventually used. But George didn't like it and instead approved this rather dour looking image. Anyway, there are two variations of this poster, one with printed in USA in the bottom right hand corner and another which, guess what, has printed in Great Britain in that same position. Of course, the album was remixed by George himself for the January 2001 release, which was both a critical and commercial success. Time will tell if this new edition matches that. As far as sound quality is concerned, I think that the UK first pressing is hands down the best sounding version of the original album. Its ethereal sound just floats out of the speakers and despite Phil Spector's wall of mud, shines on every level. As I said earlier, those first matrices continued into the early 1980s, so finding a decent sounding UK copy shouldn't be too difficult or expensive. To me, the US pressing doesn't sound as bad as some say. The vocals have a real presence and it's not a million miles away from the UK one. The 2001 remix is a different animal and for me didn't improve the sound or feel of the album. This new edition isn't meant to replace the original but just give us another choice of listening, as well as hopefully introducing the album to another audience, which can only be a good thing. Like most of these recent remix projects, they're fascinating to listen to a couple of times, especially the outtakes and demos, but rarely become my go-to copies. However you feel about it, the original is never going away, and that will always be there to enjoy. If you have the new edition, why not leave a comment telling us how you think it sounds, and if you like it or not. I'll be back with another video very soon, including a great unboxing session, plus more Beatles records from around the world. But I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching.